We are live. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited today too, because this is a joint presentation with our partner organization, Reach the World, which track long form expeditions, sharing stories, videos, pictures, and more. Um, and we have so many kids joining live from home today. Of course, uh, schools across Canada and the States are out. So thank you so much to all our YouTube viewers for tuning in for this fantastic presentation. So without further ado, we are joined in Fort Collins, Colorado by Colorado State University researcher, uh, Jesse Cramian, and she is just back from the Mosaic Expedition. So this is the largest Arctic expedition in history where an icebreaker has locked itself in the Arctic ice to float around for a whole year, collecting samples, doing all sorts of neat research. We've done many sessions with Mosaic researchers so far, but Jesse has a really, really cool job. She is gonna tell us a little bit about collecting samples in the Arctic ice, how you get them home, what kind of samples are we collecting and why. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her and thanks so much for joining us today, Jesse, and take it away. Excellent, thank you, Jesse. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay. All right, can you see my screen all right? We sure can, it's fantastic. All right, perfect. Um, so I am super excited to talk to you guys today about scientific samples collected during Mosaic, um, how we collect them, how we store them, how we get them from the North Pole, and what we actually plan to do with them after we collect them. And so um, as Jesse said, my name is Jesse. Um, I am an atmospheric research scientist in Colorado and I'm at Colorado State University. Um, I've been a research scientist in Colorado since 2012. But before that, I actually got three different degrees in chemistry. So all the way up to my PhD. Um, I'm originally from Illinois, but I moved to California for a few years before actually coming to Colorado. Um, and so for me, I absolutely love doing research in cold places. Anywhere where I can get my hands on some snow, some ice. I've been to the Arctic Ocean a few times and I've even lived at a mountaintop facility in the Alps Mountains in Switzerland. So, Anywhere that's cold, love it. Um, so my research focuses on tiny particles in the air. So little things of material in the air that you can't really see with your naked eye, um, but how those interact with clouds. And so specifically for this mosaic expedition, I was actually present there as a participant during the first leg. So I was gone for about four months starting in mid-September of last year. Um, and one more scientific well, non-scientific thing about me is I absolutely love dogs. Um, this is a picture of my two wonderful golden retrievers, Whiskey and Montana. Um, and because I'm working from home today, they're out playing around, but they may interrupt me. So I apologize in advance if I have to tend to the doggies. They're outside right now running around in the mud. Um, so Mosaic, um, Jesse had mentioned, this is an incredibly huge expedition, one of the largest to date in the Arctic. And it stands for Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. And basically what it is, is a ship or an icebreaker that's sailing up to the North Pole, essentially getting locked into the Arctic ice and frozen there for an entire year, taking all sorts of different measurements. So we have researchers that are there throughout the year taking measurements all the way from the bottom of the ocean to the sea ice, all the way to the top of the atmosphere. And so I'll kind of talk a little bit of today about what kind of samples that we collect, um, and show you some pictures from my experiences there during the first four months of it. So we saw all kinds of cool things like polar bears. We saw Northern Lights. Um, we were actually able to ride in helicopters to be transported between two different ships. And then this top picture on the right here is kind of what we looked like on a day-to-day -day basis. We had these really, really thick, warm, special polar clothing that we would have to wear to protect ourselves from the really extreme harsh temperatures every day when we were on the ice. And so the reason why we would go on the ice a lot of the times, and a lot of the samples that we collected were on the ship as well, um, were samples that we're going to use a lot of different scientists in order to understand what types of things are in the samples and how the samples are changing over the course of the entire year and with an Arctic that's actually becoming warmer over time. And so my research focuses a lot on these samples. And so that's what I participated in a lot during the first leg was actually collecting these samples. And so some of the major samples that we collected included sea ice. So here's a picture of some sea ice cores that we would collect um, with my little helper here, mascot Bjorn the polar bear. 
we would collect seawater samples. So we would actually have to make these huge holes in the ice to send equipment down into the ocean so we could collect the water. Um, we would have different people collecting different types of animals. Uh, snow samples were common, commonly collected ever during throughout the week. So we would have snow that would fall onto the ice surface. And so we would want to collect that. And then we also would collect air samples. So those aerosol particles, those things that I, that I kind of mentioned before that I focus on, we would collect those to look at different types of measurements of those as well. And so the reason why we really want to collect all these different types of samples is because we want to understand how they're all connected. And so this schematic here is specific to mosaic, but it's basically showing how all the different processes in the Arctic are connected to each other. And so, for example, here you can see the ecosystem in the ocean um, that is linked to the ecosystem in the sea ice. And sometimes these ecosystems can create emissions that make their way into the atmosphere where they can actually change the chemistry of the atmosphere, where they can create aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And so these different things can affect um, climate processes like clouds, sunlight, temperature. So we really want to understand how these things all work together to make the Arctic climate and weather happen. And so that's why we're collecting all these different types of samples. And so for the sea ice, we collected them using special equipment. Um, so the non-special side of things is we would have just your standard battery powered drill that we would operate these special, um, they're called ice coring barrels. And so here's some pictures of those. And that little red and orange twisty thing is about three feet long. And what we would do is we would connect that to the drill. And so these pictures here are showing some scientists using the ice coring equipment. And at the end of these barrels, as you can see here by this picture, they have these really sharp blades. And so as this barrel would spiral down into the ice, the blades would cut it. So we would get this basically up to three feet long rod that would come out of the ice sample. And so once we would have these samples, it really depended on the types of measurements that we would do on them for how they would be stored or transported. So sometimes we would actually take the entire ice core <clears throat> and we would put it in a bag and they would remain stored and transported frozen. So sometimes they were stored anywhere from about minus four to minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty cold temperatures. Um, so we had a lot of facilities on the ship that we could store the ice cores in. And then once you know it was time to transport them back to land, we have another icebreaker that goes up there with a uh, frozen storage to bring them back to land to people's laboratories. Now, sometimes these ice cores were melted for laboratory analysis. So some of these ice cores, we would actually, in the field after we would collect them, we would saw them into different segments. And so the reason we did this is we wanted to do measurements on each of those segments to see how certain things might change as you go into the sea ice. So we can see how different properties and measurements change as we get closer to the water surface where the water and the ice interact. Now, sometimes we would take that melted sample and we would send it through a filter. So think of how like a Brita system works at home when you have to filter your water for drinking. Um, that filtered material is what we're interested in. So there are all kinds of organisms that are living in the sea ice and different types of material. And so we wanna collect that material to see what it is. So we would take those filters and we would freeze them and preserve them so we can look at what's actually there later on. And so some examples of measurements that we would take on the sea ice would be things like temperature. We would measure how thick the sea ice was and how that's changing over time, how much salt is in the sea ice, different types of microbes that are present. So things like plankton, bacteria, algae. Um, we would also look at the nutrients that these microbes are eating in the ice and other different types of particles and then gases such as methane and oxygen that can be trapped in bubbles in the sea ice. So here's some examples of kind of how this, this activity looked during the first leg of mosaic. So every week there would be a whole group's of scientists that would go out to collect these ice cores. And so you can kind of see what that looks like here on the left. We have these scientists setting up equipment, including the coring equipment on the ice. Um, in this picture right here, kind of, oops, in this picture right here in the middle, um, that's actually in the field, we would take the ice core once it was pulled out and we would put it on this special tray to measure it. And then that probe that you can kind of see here, that's actually measuring temperature. So we would do certain things 
right after collecting the cores on the sea ice and then bring them back to the ship. Uh, this video here in the upper right is showing um, me actually taking that melted sea ice. So after we would cut it up, we would bring it back to the lab on the ship. We would melt those samples and measure how much liquid we would get from them. And then we would put them into different bottles and send them through different filters or freeze them for different types of analysis for scientists who want them off the ship. Um, this image on the bottom here is a really cool one. So this is actually a cross section of a sea ice core segment, but scientists can shine special types of light on it to look at how the ice will reflect light back. So you can see the different colors I mean, there's different type of ice there. So there's all types of stuff that's being done on these ice cores um, that we can use that information later to look at different properties of the sea ice. And so on to the seawater. Um, so there are a lot of different ways the seawater is collected as well. Um, we would sometimes directly collect seawater in special little tubes. Um, for example, when I was there, there would be these cracks that open up in the sea ice and we would collect water from those. There was a tap on the icebreaker that similar to your kitchen tap, but it was pulling in seawater from underneath the icebreaker. And so we could collect samples from that. We could also collect samples from a thing called a CTD rosette. And what that stands for is conductivity, temperature, and depth. And that's what this big gray thing is right here. So you can see my little mascot Bjorn posing in front of the CTD rosette. And basically this is a huge piece of equipment that's connected to a really long, really strong cable. And this thing would actually be put into that big hole on the side of the ship drop down to the bottom of the ocean, so almost to 15,000 feet deep. And what happens is as this thing comes up, these gray things are special bottles that will open at different times in the ocean so we can collect samples all the way down to the bottom. And so these samples that we would collect would either be stored frozen at minus four to minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, we might filter them to look at the material in the seawater and then freeze those filters. And sometimes we would have samples that would come in from the CTD that we would look at directly on the icebreaker. So measuring different types of things in the seawater there. And so some examples of seawater measurements that we would do would be, you know, temperature, salt content, microbes, the nutrients for the microbes, particles, gases, a lot of similar things to what we would look at in the ice cores as well. I use some really fun pictures of how we would collect seawater during the first leg of mosaic. So on the left here, you can see me looking at a very fancy tube full of seawater from a crack in the ice. Um, all these gray bottle CTD equip pieces of equipment, you can see scientists working around. Um, it would take a whole team of scientists and ship crew members to send this thing into the ocean to collect samples that we needed. Um, and then on the right here, these are some examples of the holes setups that we would have to put in the ice to send these things into the ocean. And again, with Bjorn posing in front of them with me. So there are also the animals that we collected. Um, so we had certain types of ecologists that were there specifically to look at the fish in the Arctic. So these big organisms were caught using special fishing lines, sometimes with hundreds of hooks that are baited um, on a weekly basis. And so this is an example of a fish that was caught during the first lake. Now we also care about all the really tiny microorganisms in the water. So this picture down here with all these little critters is showing just kind of a general range of the different types of organisms that can live in the water that you can't always see with your naked eye. And so these small organisms were collected using these really special nets. And so this top right picture, you can see this weird triangular thing. And so that is a special type of net that will go in the hole by the ice it can go down hundreds to thousands of feet into the water and it will open up and collect all these little sea creatures as it's making its way to the top of the surface. And so these different types of animals were treated very differently on the icebreaker once they were collected. So sometimes like the fish, for example, they were actually dissected on board and their parts were frozen for different types of analysis later on down the line. Um, these little microorganisms that were collected, so all these little um, shrimp-like things, little plankton, little algae, they were actually separated into their different species and sorted. So we had ecologists on board that that was their main job was to basically separate these things based off knowing what was alike versus alike. And so 
these different samples were, will later on be used to look at the DNA of the organisms and also to look at the ecosystem population. So kind of like doing a human census, they're doing a census on the types of organisms and how many there are over the entire year in the Arctic Ocean. Um, we also had snow sample collection. So um, these samples were collected, scientists would go out every week, they would bring snow machines with sleds full of equipment to go dig these snow pits and they would use special tools to take snow samples on the side of these snow pits. So these different pictures are kind of showing some activities of snow pit sample collection when it was still light out before I was there. Um, and this picture on the right is showing some vials full of snow that we had collected during the first leg. And so typically these samples were stored frozen and some of the measurements that are being done on the snow include temperature, of course. We wanna know how deep the snow is over the course of the year. Um, then there's scientists who wanna look at snow crystal shape and size. Um, some scientists wanna look at the types of microbes that are in the snow and see if those are linked to what we see in the sea ice and in the ocean. And then of course, particles and gases that are coming from the snow surface. Okay, and last but not least, my area of expertise, the aerosol particles. Um, so aerosols are these tiny little, little bitty things that are suspended in the air and they come from different things at the surface. So um, I collect them in the air by using equipment that kind of works similar to your household vacuum cleaner. Um, so basically these equipment will pull in air and then they'll collect those aerosol particle materials onto the filters or different types of, of um, sample materials that we want to collect them on to look at them later on. And so these types of samples are stored either frozen or at room temperature. It really depends on the work that's gonna be done on them. So <clears throat> some of these samples are going to be used to look at the chemistry of the aerosol particles that are there. So are we seeing things like dust that's making its way up to the Arctic or are we seeing microbes? So we're looking at the biology of these things. We're looking to see if we see any pollution aerosol particles there. So all these different types of analysis will tell us what types of aerosols are there. Um, we're also gonna be looking at the shape and size of all these tiny little particles in the air, how many of them there are, so their quantity. And then a lot of people like myself, especially what we're focusing on is their relevance for climate. So like I said, I focus on how aerosols affect clouds and how they basically act like a seed for a cloud to form on. So they kinda, basically, if you think of a cloud like a plant, I study the seeds for the clouds. And so we look at different properties of these aerosols that we collect and how they might be relevant for things like cloud formation and how they interact with sunlight. And so these pictures are just showing some examples of these different types of samplers. And they kind of just look like suitcases almost. You can put them out on the ice or you can put them on the ship. They pull in air and collect these samples over the entire year. Um, and so, that's generally the samples that were collected for Mosaic. And for me, for specifically for leg one, um, I care about not just the aerosol, but I also wanna look at the seawater, the sea ice, the snow, because I really wanna see, all right, what's in the air and is the stuff from the surface making its way into the air? And at what time of year, how many of them, and then what they're doing to the climate up there. And so from leg one alone, we collected about 2,300 samples just for my stuff. So that's just for one part of the expedition. Yes, <laughs> Jesse's counting. There will be thousands and thousands of samples that um, are going to be stored here in my lab until I can analyze them. Um, and then these are just some fun pictures of me doing some work in the field. Up here on the left is a little aerosol sampler that I put out on the ice um, that will actually collect aerosols near these cracks that form to see if the stuff in the water it's making its way into the air. Um, these pictures on the right are me collecting seawater and working with sea ice meltwater samples. And then here in the bottom, just some fun field work photos. So um, this picture here in particular, you can see this weird ice ball formation on my eyelashes. Um, it's really cold in the Arctic. And when you breathe, this stuff forms little ice balls all over anything that hangs. So there are some pretty fun pictures of things like that during the expedition. And so um, those in general are the types of samples that we collect during Mosaic. Um, people like myself were there collecting them, but after we leave, we have different collaborators and colleagues that are continuing the collection of these samples for the entire year. 
And so again, here's some more fun pictures from Mosaic. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in and I'm happy to answer any and all questions you guys have. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Jesse. And I can say you're the only person ever to say if you think of a cloud like a plant in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants. So <laughs> I that immensely. <laughs> So we've got 30 plus groups and people watching right now from all over Canada and the States. Uh, and so as, as more pour in, just let me know where you're joining from, type in any questions you want. I'll take as many as we can from the chat bar. But I wanna start off with one of my own. In a lot of your pictures, you have this red light in various rooms and outside doing some of your samples. So what's the red light all about? Why that color? So the red light is really important, especially the time of year in the Arctic when it's dark. So we have these microbes that I mentioned that are living in the sea ice, they're living in the snow and the water. And right now, well, not right now, but when we were there, they're used to it being dark all the time. And what happens is when microbes, certain types of them are exposed to light, they start becoming more active and productive. And so we wore the red light so we didn't artificially stimulate these microbes um, because they don't really react to red light as much as they do white light. So for example, if we would have wore a normal headlamp that had a bright white light, the microbes might think, oh, it's daytime. I need to start doing something different. So that's that's why we had to work under red light conditions. We we're dealing with samples where we cared about measuring the microbes. Hmm, super cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, all right. Henry and Edie in Rockwood, Ontario want to know, what are some of the things you thought you'd learn from the ice? And was there anything unexpected when you were there? Yeah. So <clears throat> a lot of... I mean, we, so we got up to the ice and we knew with the Arctic warming, things were gonna be pretty dynamic. So if you think of the sea ice, it's this huge piece of ice that covers the Arctic Ocean, but it doesn't move as one big piece. It's always kind of moving with the currents and the winds, but there's different pieces that will move at different times. And so what happens is you can have cracks that form. You can have things like if two pieces of ice are being pushed together, they form ridges. So we expected that to happen to some extent, but when we were up there, we had a storm, particularly during November, where it really, I mean, we saw things, observatories on the ice move 500 meters from where they were originally. So the ice was a lot more dynamic than we thought it'd be. Um, in terms of the measurements that we're doing on the ice, we, we really only had the manpower and, well, women power to, to collect the samples on the ice. So we didn't do a ton of analysis. So we aren't able to really look at any results yet, but we're hoping to see some really unique changes in the types of things in the ice and the air and the water over the course of the entire year when you have things like no sunlight versus sunlight or when the temperatures are really cold or not cold. So um, the only unexpected thing we observed so far was just how much the ice moves. It was crazy. <laughs> Very neat. Um, Jesse, by the way, if you want to come out of screen share so we can see you oh. more clearly when you're into that's okay. No, it's a fantastic picture. Best picture. Ever. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Charles in Chicago wants to know, what's the hardest thing about collecting samples in the Arctic? Oh, the hardest thing is having to deal with the conditions. So, for example, there would be days where the temperatures were about minus 40 Fahrenheit and you it's really challenging to work in those conditions, especially if it's not just that temperature, but being from Chicago area, I know how windy it can get there and the wind chill can be terrible, but in the Arctic, it's, you know, 10 times worse. So the challenging thing is definitely working in those types of conditions when you have to go out on the ice for five, six hours to collect samples. Um, working in the dark is really difficult. We had very powerful headlamps, but it's still really challenging to kind of see what you're doing. And because we would have the ice constantly moving and forming cracks, sometimes you would take our snow machines out. So we would have a whole caravan of people with snow machines and sleds getting ready to go collect a bunch of ice cores. You would take our normal path out there and then boom, a huge crack in the ice had appeared overnight. So there would be a lot of times where we would have to adapt to the environmental and weather conditions just to collect our samples. And a lot of times, we couldn't collect them because it was just too dangerous or hazardous or cold. Okay. So you answered quite, there's quite a few questions about how cold it gets. And when it's night, <laughs> minus 40, when it's the same in Celsius as Fahrenheit, you know that it's freezing. Yes. <laughs> and so a question from Katie, she wants to know, what piece of clothing can you not live without when you're outside in the Arctic? Woo, there's quite a few. <laughs> um, when I was there, it was pretty cold. So there are times actually in the Arctic summer 
up that high where the sun's shining all day long, the temperatures actually aren't that bad. So you can get away without certain types of equipment, but particularly during the winter, you have to have a very special parka that it kind of feels like you're wearing five sleeping bags. Um, it's super warm and heavy, but it's wonderful. And oh, here's a dog right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really wonderful. So they keep you nice and warm. Um, boots, very important. So you have to have special polar boots. Oh, sorry, I got a dog that's gonna come, come inside really quick. One of our rare dog breaks here at Exploring Mother <laughs> Pants. Sometimes there are other animals, today it's a canine. <laughs> <laughs> yep, not polar bears, but golden retrievers. <laughs> um, yeah, so wearing special boots is really important, especially when you're out there standing on the ice, your feet get really cold. So we have to wear these kind of ridiculous looking clown boots that keep your feet warm and prevent them from getting frostbite. I have to follow up with a question because you said five sleeping bags, which is oddly specific. Have you ever actually gotten in five sleeping bags to compare <laughs> you making this up as you go along? No, but you know, I, it's not the first time I've said that and I feel like I should just put on five sleeping bags to see if it's, if it's relevant. <laughs> a follow-up session coming next week with you in the bags, okay. Um, all right, uh, Luca, also in, I think there's a lot of Chicago today, yeah, wants Ooh. to know if there is different things that you find in the ice than in the seawater. So we think there are, there, um, <clears throat> we haven't done a lot with the mosaic samples yet to really look at it relevant to that study, but there are researchers who have looked at this in the past. And there's definitely different types of algae that live in the sea ice versus the ocean. And there are also different types of fish, for example, for larger organisms. So there are certain types of little fish that like to live in little pockets in the ice versus the fish that you might find a few hundred feet down. Um, different size, different types of fish. There are different types of bacteria that might exist in the ocean versus in the sea ice. So they can be pretty different, but also sometimes they can be similar, but these microbes like to have their specific habitats and they get kind of used to that. So they are going to probably look a little different, especially as the sun starts to come out, which is starting to happen now, I guess. But yeah, as the sun starts to come out and these microbes and plankton start to kind of a wake up from winter time, then we'll start to hopefully see some changes and differences in the ice versus the water. Fantastic. Well, so while we're on this animal trend, we've got a group in Montreal and Jake in Birmingham, Alabama that want to know, have you seen, did you see any aquatic mammals, any polar bears when you were up there? Any, yeah. Yes. So polar bears, we definitely saw those, um, mostly in the beginning of the study. So when we were kind of we had two icebreakers that went up there because we needed so many people and so many different pieces of equipment to set up. And so as both icebreakers were going up, we would see, once we reached the ice, we would see polar bears. So we actually, there was one time we saw a mom polar bear and her two cubs and they were just kind of walking around the ice and playing. It, it was really cute. The cubs were playing in the, the open water parts. And then another time we saw another mom and her cub um, there was one time that there was this huge male polar bear that came through the ice camp and I, I didn't show a picture of it, but there was a picture that someone took of a human footprint of like a tall man versus the polar bear footprint and it was really impressive. So definitely a lot of polar bears. Sometimes you would see birds on the way up. Um, what else did we see? Yeah, that was almost it. There was an Arctic fox. We did see cool. an Arctic fox. So that was pretty cool. You should be the person that Colorado State sends out to like solicit kids to become scientists because you're doing a very good job. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, William in Washington DC wants to know why use a boat instead of a building? Why not build a structure up there instead? So I kind of I kind of talked about how the Arctic sea ice is not just one big piece. It can break apart and move and create these ridges that kind of look like mini snow and ice mountains ranges. And so the reason why we try to make the main observatory a ship is if the ice completely breaks apart, you are going to be safe. <laughs> However, we do have, so Mosaic is not just the main icebreaker that people are living and doing science on. So a lot of times on the ice, there are these different, we call them cities. So they're little huts basically that are set up. And so we had one city that was Ocean City, and that was where some scientists were doing ocean measurements. There was a Met City or a meteorological city where people were 
doing measurements on different types of weather and, and temperature and humidity winds. And then, so we had a few of those little cities that were set up on the ice and we experienced kind of firsthand how it's good to have those things, but if you, if the ice is constantly cracking and changing, I mean, we, you could have equipment fall in the water. Luckily, knock on wood, we didn't during the first leg, but we definitely had this 100 foot tower that was measuring things up in the atmosphere fall over because of the cracks. So having a big structure on the ice is really dangerous because the ice can crack under it. And so, you know, losing a little hut in the water, that's, you know, it's, it's not a great thing, but it's not the end of the world. So the main stuff all happened on the ship and that's where we lived so that we didn't fall in the water as well. So this is quite the extreme environment and this is something that we didn't get so far in a question and you didn't address too much in your talk, but how do you get out to this place? Like what is the protocol to get from where you are today to <laughs> the ship? How long does it take? What's going on? All right, well, for people like us in the US and Canada, you know, we have to fly. We were leaving from Norway. So very Northern part of Norway, there's a port city. That's where we kind of get to, to start, start our journey. <clears throat> so once we get there, there are scientists that go on another icebreaker. So we have the main icebreaker um, that stays up there for the entire year. And then we have other icebreakers that will take turns essentially taking people and cargo. So you have to, you know, restock food, Sometimes scientific equipment breaks down and we have to bring out new parts or new equipment. And so all of this stuff, people and equipment and food will go out to this other icebreaker. And it's, <clears throat> it's really challenging because you can't really go right up next to the other icebreaker so that they're side by side because you're, you can disturb the measurements and you can make the ice move and you don't want to, you know, you want to affect science as little as possible and keep it safe. So the, the exchanges that we've done so far have been on a different icebreaker. And so it'll park up kind of, you know, close enough to the other one for about a week or two weeks where people can walk over and train each other on how to do things. We can exchange materials and equipment. And that's kind of how we've been doing it so far. Um, as time goes on, you know, when the ice is starting to melt throughout the summer, it's going to be a little more challenging. So you know, we have a plan, but we just kind of have to adapt to what happens up there and, and see how it works out. I like too how, you know, there's so much that happens after you get to Northern Norway, which is not exactly the, you know, most casual place to get to. So quite easy <laughs> to get there. Um, Sand, you, so you mentioned getting supplies there and getting food. So Sandra wanted to ask on YouTube, what kind of food do you eat? Is it like gruel in a bag? Or are you having steak and lobster every night? <laughs> um, so let's, I mean, the food, actually there's, I say icebreaker, but it's kind of like a hotel ship. So it's a pretty nice vessel that's up there. We have, you know, rooms that we share with a roommate. There's a whole dining hall area with a kitchen. And so we would eat pretty, pretty good food. So it's, it's a German icebreaker. So it's, it was definitely a lot of German food, um, which if you are a vegetarian like myself, sausage is not exactly something that I eat. So, um, we would have, you know, fish sometimes, there would be some meat, there would be a lot of potatoes, um, breads and cheeses, we would have ice cream, surprisingly. Um, there was luckily for us who needed to stay awake for long hours doing work, coffee machines, um, you know, there you eat kind of like a normal diet. So um, it wasn't too bad. And, and, and when you're working in those kind of conditions where it's that cold, you have all this clunky equipment on and you're trying to walk around on the ice and like do all this manual labor on the ice, you burn a lot of calories. So I ate a lot of bread and kind of lost weight because you're just working so hard. So yeah, you, you kind of want to have those carb heavy foods to try to sustain yourself while you're out there. Yeah. And so you talk about burning all these calories, doing all this work. So Henry and Edie again in Rockwood want to know how long do you stay out on the ice? So like how long do you collect for one time and how long does that process take? So we, for safety reasons, because, you know, polar bears, they're cute to look at, but you don't want to run into one on the ice. So we, for safety reasons, we were st restricted to spending so much time on the ice. So usually, you know, I think it was maybe 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning, we could go onto the ice. Um, most people would come back in for lunch and then go back out and continue to do work until like four or five in the evening. 
Um, so it varied on the activity. Some people, you know, they were working on getting stuff set up. So they had to be out there for both shifts. There were some people that like for our ice pouring days, sometimes it would only take three to five hours. Um, so we would be out for about that long, but we would have things, if you're out there for a long time, you kind of take precautions. And so when we were coring, we would actually set up these fishing, ice fishing tents. And so we would use those as shelters if it was too windy or cold to kind of warm up in, or sometimes like if we were recording data out there or cutting up the samples, we would do that in a tent to try to, to minimize the exposure to the elements. Um, so yeah, people were be out there for hours at a time and it's pretty exciting. It is exciting. <laughs> um, perfect softball question since the dog had the brief interruption. We've got a bunch of people that want to know, let you know that they have dogs too and they love their dogs just as much. And uh, the question uh, from the group in Alabama is how old are your dogs? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me see if I can show them. We have Montana. She is two and a half years old. Say hi, Montana. Jesus, she loves seeing people. Um, and then we have the old sleepy one, Whiskey. She's about eight years old. Um, nice. They've been playing around like crazy since I've been at home. So they're, well, the young one never seems to get tired, but the old one, she's, she's, she's getting a little sleepy now. <laughs> Funny. Well, I'm glad for the question. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so you, at the beginning, you talked about going to the Arctic. You talked about the Swiss Alps. So what, just as a question for me, what attracts you to all these cold places? These sort of places are not for everyone. Have you always been interested? What's the appeal? Um, kind of. So it actually started in graduate school. So when I was in San Diego, not a very cold place, but um, I did field work in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California and specifically during the late winter into spring where they're still getting a ton of snow that time of year and it's cold. And I just found it really beautiful, like the snow and the mountains and the cold extreme air and how delicate and pristine these environments are. Um, so I just really liked the beauty about it and how, you know, things that, that we're doing to the planet can affect places like that. And I don't like that, you know, you want to keep these places pretty and pristine and be able to enjoy them. So um, that's where it all started with the mountains. and especially going to the Swiss Alps, that was pretty cool to live up there. Um, and then it just kind of moved to the Arctic because although, you know, no one, well, some crazy people do, but people go up there to do expeditions on skis, but you know, it's not a common place that people visit, but it's still a really beautiful and delicate ecosystem. And so my interest in working in places like that is to try to help understand things that happen there so we can protect it. Thanks. Thank you. Good, great answer. Um, all right, uh, Peter uh, in Chicago wants to know what's your favorite vehicle to ride in in the Arctic. Oh, let's see. <clears throat> you know, I've been on a snow machine, snowmobile. I think some people call them snowmobiles, snow machines, whatever. Yeah. Those <laughs> things. They're really, <laughs> they're pretty fun to ride around on the Arctic sea ice. So when you're on stepping foot on the Arctic sea ice, you kind of just feel like you're on a snowy ground for the most part. Um, but it was kind of fun to ride those around and to get to the different places that we needed to go. Super cool. All right. Uh, a good question sort of logistically with the ship. Uh, again, from Claire in Alabama wants to know how many people are on these expeditions at one time? So at any one time, so I kind of mentioned this thing called a leg. So that's just basically a segment of the expedition um, where people kind of stay there. So we have six different legs that are happening for the entire year. And the only, the reason why we do that is because it's not easy to get people back and forth between the ships. So we have to have designated times for that and it can't happen that often. So <clears throat> for these legs, we would have approximately, I would say 50 to 60 scientists at any given time. And then we would have about 30, maybe 40, 50 crew members. And so the crew members are kind of the people who help take care of the mechanics of the ship, make sure the ship is working. They'll help operate some of the heavier equipment on the ship and help fix things. And then the scientists are there obviously doing the science. So we'll kind of change out most of those people, scientists and crew for every different leg. And so in total throughout the entire year, there's going to be, I think numbers are somewhere along the lines of six to 700 different scientists that are going to be on the ship 
um, throughout the year. And then of course we have the crew members that are constantly swapping out. So quite a few people and from almost 20 different countries. Yeah, fantastic. Again, and we can uh, pass this along in a chat uh, on the YouTube page in a second, but I'll pass along the mosaic information so that people can look up the expedition on the whole, learn more, and then exploring by the seat of your pants also has all sorts of other sessions with researchers uh, and reach the world as well. So you can learn more about the expedition. Um, Jesse, this is great. We're going to do two more quick questions and then we'll right. wrap up from there. The first is, so we were talking about the Arctic with this mosaic expedition. Is there similar work being done in Antarctica and do you have an interest in ever going there? Ah. I definitely have interest in going there. <laughs> um, the, the cool thing about the Arctic versus the Antarctic is the Arctic is, you know, it's land, but the main part where we were is ocean and sea ice. So it is a different ecosystem and a different environment. And the, the land, or sorry, the ice and the water surface can interact with the air differently versus the Antarctic where it's some ocean, but it's mostly a land mass. And so it's a really thick piece of ice that's on land. Um, so there are some similarities between the two different poles, but also some very big differences. Um, and yeah, I definitely have interest in going there, but the nice thing about the Antarctic, you're pretty isolated. It's not easy to get there, but you can live on land. So it is a little different. Um, there are ships that go down there. So for example, there was a study um, that was led by a Swiss agency, I think a couple years ago now, where they actually took a ship and they sailed around the entire continent of Antarctica. And so they wanted to kind of, I think that happened over the course of like somewhere between three and five months. Um, it was called ACE and I can't, Arctic Circumnavigation Experiment. Um, so there are similar things that are being done on ships down, mostly over open water though down there. And the stuff that's being done on the ice is on land. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different, but, but similar in some ways too. Yeah, fantastic. Um, you said earlier in your presentation that uh, you're upset with sort of the changes that are happening up there. And a lot of this research, of course, is being done to understand more about climate change. So for the kids tuning in, if you're at home in Chicago, in Alabama, in Ontario, whatever, what can you do to help curb climate change? Like, what can we do at home to help mitigate this, this issue and this change that's happening that we're seeing all around the world? Yeah, so it's it's really challenging problem. Um, if we understood how to fix it easily, you know, we'd be doing it. Um, what people can do, and it may seem like a small thing, but, you know, just being conscious about how you use energy, how, you know, your carbon footprint. So things like, you know, if you have to go a few blocks away, maybe walk or ride a bike instead of taking a vehicle. Um, there are little things that you can do, like recycling, composting. Um, things to kind of reduce your own carbon footprints to help with climate change. And so you may think, all right, I'm one person. What's the big deal if I just do this? But if you if you do it, which is a relatively easy way to change your life a little bit if you're not doing it already, um, is you can talk to other people into doing it. And then the more and more people that do it, you have strength by numbers where, you know, if we have everyone who's being conscious about this stuff, then it might make an impact. Um, the thing, the, the main cause of it, you know, is we have these greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. And so these are the things that are essentially acting like blankets and trapping in heat. Um, the problem with those and the things that are already up there, so these greenhouse gases don't just go away. They kind of live up there for hundreds, some of them even thousands of years. So we're going to continue to see a warming effect, even if we completely stop emitting greenhouse gases right now. Um, but it can definitely slow it down. And so you know, just trying to play your part, that's the simplest thing you can do. And, you know, a lot of you are not of the age of 18, but <laughs> when you are, um, voting for politicians who are really have strong platforms on climate change and trying to mitigate that is really important. So that's kind of like, you know, a small thing you can do that could potentially make a larger impact for things like regulations for industries and, and, and vehicle manufacturers, for example. So there are little things that you can do that if a lot of us do it, could, could make, make an impact. Fantastic. Well, what a great place to wrap up on, Jesse. Um, to all our students tuning in from Alabama, Illinois, New York State, Washington, and across Ontario and beyond, we got, again, over 30 groups watching. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, please do check out, I posted in the, the YouTube links, uh, the link to Mosaic Expedition, the link to reach the World's Mosaic page, and you can look up Jesse as well. Fantastic. Learn a little bit more about all the work she's doing. Jesse, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Yes, thank you, Jesse.